welcome to another video from the Soundcard database. As some of you may already know, I'll be moving into a house during the summer, and I have a lot of stuff to pack, especially in my case, some sound cards. So while some of them may be already boxed, uh, most of the sound cards I own are not. They're bare cards without boxes or documentation and the problem with bare cards is a static electricity so I got a box I hope everything will fit inside but first let's add some cautioning just to protect the most delicate of the cards during transport some of my cards may already have come with uh, ESD bags but most of my collection did not so I have to buy myself some uh, ESD bags which is an easier task than I first thought you can buy uh, any quantity and size of bags directly on eBay I measured some of my sound cards uh, just to get an idea of what a standard sound card would be like and what size of bag I would need uh, so I settled on anti-static bags of 258 millimeters by 180. I bought them from a nicer store, which in fact were very nice and very helpful. And by the magic of video editing, the ESD bags arrived just 10 seconds later by the mail, which is pretty impressive. I bought 40 of them. I think I will have enough, but we'll see. First card coming up is an ad lib from 1987. It's the original sound card for PCs and compatibles. The card itself is made of off the shelf components. In my case, it's the earliest version I have encountered in the wild. You can see the serial number here it's 13,842. If you have an earlier version of AdLib, please take pictures and let me know. Alright, so let's get this baby in the bag. It needs to be preserved, and that's what I like. Next in line is an AdLib from 1990. You can see the model has changed slightly. Apart from a few betterments in the design, uh, the, the most obvious change is the use of a standard headphone connector instead of the original. Next up is an AdLib card, but it's not really an AdLib card. This one comes from Germany, because at the time when AdLib went bankrupt, the company was bought by people in Germany. They renamed the company to AdLib Multimedia and they produced a couple of sound cards. This one is not AdLib compatible, but since this one came a lot later, 95 or 96, it's mostly a Windows card and not a DOS card, so no games supported. So what we have here is the SSI 2001 replica, uh, which works pretty well in my opinion. It's very sensitive to uh, ESD discharge, so I'm keeping it in two ESD bags, mostly because of the SID chip uh, that is well known to be super sensitive to ESD. Next up are two original Sound Blasters CT1320C from Creative. This one is missing the, the volume potentiometer. It has two CMS chips, although they are not originally from Creative. This one, however, has the CMS chips, as you can see right here, and they are original from Creative, as you can see because of the stickers. You can see this one is a sound card I used to find out what size of ESD bags I would have to buy. I made the right choice. Coming up are three Sound Blasters 2.0, the revision of the original design of the Sound Blaster card. The most obvious change is the reduction in card length. You can see this one is a third revision card. This is one of the earliest cards available. Later models were renamed Sound Blaster uh, CT1315B with no revision number. It's not compatible out of the box with CMS chips. So you can see the CMS chips and the controller chip for CMS compatibility. This chip is not available generally, so it has to be custom made. It's a GAL or PAL chip. Uh, you can tell me in the comments. And yes, I have many revisions of the same sound card at the moment. I do not intend to keep all of them, but for the time being, I will take care of them and resell them in the near future, probably in the next fall. Let's put this babies in the box. Next up is a CT1330A. Uh, it's revision 6. 
This is known as the first version of the Sound Blaster Pro. You can see both FM chips on the card. So having two FM chips gives this card stereo compatibility. You can also note that the CMS compatibility is gone. This is a very lengthy card, but it does still fit in the SD bags I ordered, so I'm still happy with them. Next up are some various AdLib clones. So we have this poor bastard here that gave me so much trouble in the past in another video uh, because this card has no filtering for the 12 volt input so any interference it has you can hear everything overall it's a pretty simple sound card it works right out of the box it gives good results if you have a nice power supply but I would not recommend it because of the noise issue as I mentioned earlier this is an Aztec card. Uh, to my knowledge, no Sound Blaster compatibility. It has a Yamaha OPL3 chip, so it has stereo output, but I don't think it has digital output. At least for the moment, I have not managed to get it to work. Still, it's a nice card. Jumper settings, which I prefer. Next up is something some of you might know about. It is a Media Vision Thunderboard. It's a good card, it works right out of the box. Overall, a good card. But the only thing I dislike about this card is the very flimsy volume wheel, and I would like to change it in the future. Next is an MM Sound 2 sound card. It is ad lib compatible, I think, right out of the box, but it has additional ESS chips on board, and I think it can also output digital audio. In essence, this is an AdLib clone, but I think it is compatible with the ESS audio drive. Next is my probably my favorite AdLib clone. Uh, it is the most complete clone in my opinion. It has a standard headphone jack, a volume knob, a joystick port, has an original OPL2 Yamaha chip for FM music. It's very nice and uh, has a very good bass response. Coming up is the ATI Stereo FX, a sound card that is uh, Sound Blaster and AdLib compatible from 1992, so it, they came a little late to the party. However, it has an original OPL2, and for 1992 this is a bit surprising, and it still has CMS compatibility without the need for a GAL chip. I have tested this card with CMS chips from a Sound Blaster, and it works painlessly, so this is very interesting if you want to record CMS. Very nice card. Next up, a second offering by ATI. It is the ATI Stereo FX CD, which came later in 1992. The addition of the CD connector prompted them to remove the original CMS compatibility with the Sound Blaster. Here we have another creative card. This is a CD1350, but you can see it's missing the bracket, and the reason for that is that it was salvaged from a recycling facility. But overall, this card is in pretty surprising condition, and I'm really happy that I got it out of the huge sound card and video card bin where it was supposed to get crushed and melted for scrap metal. I'll do a video on the Recycling Center experience someday. Next up is a Windows Sound System sound card. Very interesting sound card. It's the first sound card that established or wanted to establish a standard in the sound card industry. It is compatible with MS-DOS gaming. It has an OPL3 chip and RCA connectors. Next is a standard Sound Blaster 16. It's a very early model. And you can tell that because it still has the volume wheel and it has Sound Blaster 16 processor and the ASP chip integrated on the card directly. But the ASP chip never really took off and as such most Sound Blaster 16 cards do not have the ASP chip included. So next up is another Sound Blaster 16 but this one comes with the original Wave Blaster uh, add-on card and this gives better results for uh, MIDI music than what's included in the card uh, by default. Both the card and the MIDI daughter board have a simple connector 
and they just slide inside each other seamlessly and it's there we go you have a Sound Blaster 16 and a Wave Blaster card together you can see with time uh, the cards are getting bigger and bigger and this one just barely fits in the ESD bags I ordered this is a Sound Blaster AWE32 CT2760 it comes with a Wave Blaster 2 but I can't remove it because it's clipped on the sound card. A problem I have with AWE32s is that their expansion memory slots are very fragile and they tend to break apart. Have I told you that the cards got bigger with time? Yes, they did. So this one does not fit at all. So what we have to do now is use two ESD bags for uh, longer cards like this. go. Next up is a little oddity. This is a CT1920. It is an add-on for Sound Blaster 16 cards. It gives AWE32 compatibility and features. Next up is my AWE64 Gold. This is model CT4390. I know there are two main revisions of this board and I don't know if I have the good or the bad one. I think one has the stuck note bug and the other doesn't, but I don't know which one it is. Next up is a Vibra 16, which is the cheap version of the Sound Blaster 16. I thought that most Vibra 16 cards didn't have Yamaha chips on them, however, I was wrong. And this one has an OPL3 chip, so it can output real FM music. Sound quality is not bad, however some notes sound weird in my experience. So for something completely different, because hey creative is not everything, uh, next up is some Roland stuff. Uh, I have an MPU 401 card and an SCC1. The SCC1 is a MIDI card and it's compatible, however it sounds very different from an MT32. I uh, just put it inside the computer and it works seamlessly. A very cool card to have. I know there is an SCC-1A that has more instruments uh, and is more recent, but this is the one I have. And the MPU-401 card, this is it. It comes with a, what we call a breakout box. It is the MPU-IPCT. It has MIDI connectors, input, output, and through. Next up, we have three cards from Ensonic. First, top left, we have an Ensonic Vivo 90. Then we have an Ensonic Soundscape Opus. That was a gateway OEM card. And at the bottom, we have an Ensonic Soundscape S2000. The version I have is the bare bones version. And you can see it's missing the IDE connectors. Although I do not need them, so I don't care. The sound is the same. So let's protect this baby up. Next is the Soundscape Opus that came with Gateway Computers. It's basically the same chipset as the S2000, however some features were cut a little short. And third is the Soundscape Vivo 90. It's uh, one of the last cards by Ensonic before they got bought by Creative. And this is what and Sonic did last before being bought. This is the Ensonic Audio PCI card. Uh, it's not it's not very expensive to find nowadays, uh, but it's uh, still an interesting card because it's very compatible with everything, uh, and I like it. Coming up are three different cards: two cards by Media Vision and one card by another company. This is a Pro Audio Spectrum. 16 from 1993 let's back this baby up because it does not need presentation next up you might think this is also a pro audio spectrum 16 card however you would be wrong because this one is from logitech but it still has the pro audio spectrum 16 serial number on the card although it's from logitech 
I'm guessing that Logitech marketed the card, but Media Vision designed it. And for the third card, this is an offering from QuickShot. QuickShot is a pretty well-known OEM manufacturer from the 90s for sound and joystick cards. They manufactured compatible sound cards from uh, many companies. Uh, I've seen many cards from uh, Creative manufactured by uh, QuickShot. This one has Media Vision original chips. And let's pack it up. Coming next are four different ISA cards from different species, I would say. This one is an A151A00 from uh, Yamaha. I don't have much to say for this card because I've never managed to make it work. Second is a sound card from Diamond Multimedia. It is a Pro 16 card. I don't know what it is supposed to be compatible with. I have not yet had the time to test it. Third is a sound card from Upti. Not much to say about this one. However, it sports a wavetable header, so if I wanted, I could use a wave blaster card on this. And fourth is an ESS audio drive card, pretty standard. And a, ugh, it will mean I'm using my last ESD bag for this card. Here you can see the box, and this box is completely full, and I'm not even done yet. So, yeah, what will I do? Full of sound cards. Let's see what's left to pack. First, some greatest ultrasounds, Revision 3.4. It's the original ultrasound, which I'm very happy with. And second is the last revision of the original ultrasound. It's revision 3.74, Gravis Ultrasound Max, revision 2.1. I do not know how it sounds yet, because I did not have the time to test it. A sound card from Reveal. And finally, some Sound Blaster cards. Uh, Sound Blaster Live on the left, Sound Blaster ODG at the bottom. You can see the card on the right is missing its bracket. That's because I used it for my Innovation SSI 2001 uh, replica. Next are two Kovax speech things from different generations. The earliest one is the beige one. This little device was made by Kovax in the USA and it produced digital sound by using the parallel port or the printer port on your computer. It was pretty ingenious for the time. So let's compare the two. The old version and the new version. I'm suspecting that the new version has some more filtering inside and you can see the old connectors and the new connector here. So that's it for this video. Uh, let's watch me packing this box for the move. It's pretty tightly filled, but it fits. Let's tape this baby up. And of course, don't forget to write what's in the box. Sound cards. One out of two. Two? Why two? Because I'm almost done with these, but as you can see, I still have a decent amount of boxed sound cards to take care of. I'm pretty confident that I'll be able to share more videos with shorter delays between them when the move is complete. Leave a comment if you have some details I've missed. Let me know if you have any questions. And as always, thanks for watching and talk to you soon.